Good evening. We're going to begin. My name is Mona Atea. I am the director of the Institute for Middle East Studies. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here to the Elliott School of International Affairs for the 2020 Kuwait Chair Lecture, delivered by Ambassador Ganim. We would like to thank ExxonMobil Foundation for generously supporting tonight's program, as well as the entirety of the Middle East Policy Forum. We are also honored to have in the audience this evening Ambassador Salem Abdel Jabbar Al Sabah of Kuwait, Ambassador Hunayna Sultan Al Mughari of All Men, and Ambassador Dr. Farid Yassin of Iraq. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Ambassador Ghanim is the Kuwait Professor of Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Study Affairs at the George Washington University, as well as the Director of the Middle East Policy Forum. Prior to coming to the Elliott School, Ambassador Ghanim held a distinguished 36-year career in the US Foreign Service. He was a member of the Senior Foreign Service and a career minister. During his career, he served as the US ambassador to, to Kuwait from 1991 till 1994. And he can tell you this was a very dull time to be in the region. He served as US ambassador to Australia from 2000 to 2001, and US ambassador to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan from 2001 until 2004. Ambassador Ghanim was awarded the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award for his work in Jordan by Colin Powell. This was just one of a long line of distinguished service awards recognizing his leadership. He was elected to the American Academy of Diplomacy in 2005, and he still holds many leadership positions across organizations like the American Kuwait Alliance, the Board of Directors of Venera, the Middle East Policy Council, the National US Arab Chamber of Commerce, and most recently, as president-elect of ACOR, or the American Center of Oriental Research. When Ambassador Ghanim joined the faculty at GW after his foreign service career, it was more of a homecoming. His relationship with GW started as an undergrad and remained throughout his career, having served seven terms on the Board of Trustees and recently complete, completing a term as the Vice Dean of the Elliott School in order to return to one of his true passions, writing. In a few years ago, in an interview with the Association of, Professor of Professional Schools of International Affairs, Ambassador Ghanim was asked to name the most important quality for an ambassador. After leadership, he said, humility. It is very important, quote, that the person who is an ambassador doesn't forget who he or she is. Never forget the human element, end quote. And so, Beyond his esteemed career, it is a great pleasure to introduce to you a man that truly lives by these words, and it is such a pleasure to have him as a colleague. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Ghanim. Thank you, you Mona. Can you hear me in the back? Is it working? Good, 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 good. All right, let's begin. As you can see from the title, a Persian Gulf Vortex, America's Quandary. That will tell you that's going to be a very humorous lecture tonight, right? <laughs> uh, I don't think I've done one of those in the last 15 years, but uh, one day, one day. So the intense storm caught the ship in a vortex of swirling water mammoth waves, and hurricane winds. The sea was not new to this ship. The ship had plied these waters many times before, but not in such a vortex. The captain was relatively new, and he had a well-seasoned and experienced crew. But yet to them, the captain's actions to respond to the storm seemed erratic and reactive. Whatever action he took seemed to lead to yet another crisis. Even the compass, long reliable to give a guide forward, failed. The tossing and whirling of the ship <coughs> sent the compass spinning, and confidence of those on board was certainly on the wane. Well, students in my class this semester in 
U.S. foreign policy in the Persian Gulf. We'll recall my saying in the very first session that uh, 10 years ago, I could, in fact, offer a reasonable description of what U.S. interests in the Persian Gulf were. Thwarting any hostile power that attempted to dominate the region, maintaining the free flow of oil from the Persian Gulf to global markets, and supporting security for Israel and our Arab allies. These were policies that were very well known and were very well enunciated. Not so today. Beginning in around 1990s, and very evident with our military action in Iraq in 2003, the emphasis of our actions really became to spread in other areas, such as bringing democracy to the region and the world, eliminating the tyrants that were there, and of course, a war on terrorism. Now, not surprisingly, these new alleged objectives were not very popular with the autocratic allies that we had in the region. And unfortunately, the people in the region soon began to interpret the war on terrorism as a war on Islam. The US propensity to move the goalposts often leads to unfortunate consequences. In recent remarks, former US ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Chaz Freeman, noted that our intervention in Afghanistan on October 7th, 2001, uh, and he observed then that by the 17th of December of that year, and this is a quote, this is his opinion, we'd accomplished our basic objectives of killing, capturing, or dispersing the Al-Qaeda architects of 9-11, and thrashing the Taliban to teach them that they cannot afford to provide safe haven to enemies of the United States. Yet he continued, rather than cutting a deal, we moved the goalposts, committing ourselves to provide liberty and gender equality, among other things in a country dominated by ethnic divisions and tribal loyalties. Well, our 2003 invasion of Iraq was a major shift of US policies in the Gulf. It was from maintaining a status quo so demonstrated by our liberation of Kuwait, our uh, defeat, uh, forcing Hussein to withdraw. It, but it shifted into, we were going to now shape the region the way we thought it should be. Too bad we found no weapons of mass destruction. Um, too bad the Iraqis seemed more focused on ethnic differences than Jeffersonian democracy. Too bad that years of socialism didn't bloom into a capitalist-driven economy. Oh, well. But we did get results. Um, Iraqi leaders struggled with a Western-designed political system. Power shifted from Iraqi Sunni minority, uh, uh, Sunni minority that had governed the country since Ottoman times. And that shift was to a Shia majority seeking redress for what they viewed as decades of mistreatment. The resulting Iraqi government's estrangement of the Sunni population pushed thousands of Iraqis toward extremist groups. Islamic State foremost among them. And of course, that group ultimately spread chaos throughout Iraq and Syria. As a result of the chaos, Iraq was no longer a balance to Iranian regional ambitions. Or was it the beacon of democracy that we had claimed it would be? Instead, Iraq became an abyss that rulers and citizens in the region did not want replicated in their own domain. The vortex, the swirling and multiple crises that we see today in the Persian Gulf define a region far removed from the pre-2003 environment. Issues are no longer as discrete. They are not as isolated from one another as they were before, but intertwined in such a way that any action to deal with one invariably has an impact on another, and not always in the direction that we would like things to go. 
Let's take for an example the recent U.S. assassination of Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, leader of the El Quds Force of the Iranian Republican Guard Corps. Soleimani was a key figure in Iranian efforts to build pro-Iranian groups in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. Clearly, his elimination would undercut or at least set back Iranian regional efforts, but mark it, not Iran's hegemonic ambitions. It's worth recalling that since 2011, our forces in Iraq are there to work with the Iraqi government against ISIS. But this action that we took was taken unilaterally and without the knowledge or consent of the Iraqi government. It also targeted an official of a neighboring country with which Iraq has diplomatic relations, in that it can only be defined as a clear violation of Iraq's sovereignty. The hostile reaction that followed was entirely predictable. Iraqis were outraged at the violation of their country's sovereignty, but also at what they saw as American disdain for their own situation. Our actions played right into the hands of pro-Iranian factions in Iraq, and alas, in Iran itself. It led to a vote by the Iraqi legislature calling for the removal of US forces from a country, from the country, and that's exactly what Iran wanted, the expulsion of US forces from a country that it wanted to dominate. Admittedly, now the resolution was non-binding, but the caretaker prime minister called for the withdrawal of US forces, even though many other Iraqis, both in and out of government, were not in favor of that. They were opposed, of course, for a couple of reasons. One is that they knew that our presence was vital to deal with ISIS, the resurgent organization there, but also that we were important as a balance to that intense, extensive Iranian influence. And our actions in the country jeopardized our presence there. The elimination of the remnants of ISIS, a group which does in fact retain the ability to destabilize the region, remains a primary objective and is vital to our and Iraq's national interest. Our regional allies want an American presence. They want us to train their local forces and to support them in, a complex, in the complex counterterrorism operations that they face. And to achieve this objective, the US needs local support. In Iraq, that means support from the Iraqi government and hopefully from the Iraqi people as well. Yet after the assassination of Soleimani, the Iraqi government issued orders to its forces not to continue joint operations with the United States or coalition forces. Now, the Iraqi government has since modified that order, but clearly any pause in actions against ISIS gives them the opportunities to regroup, regroup and to undertake operations, which they did. The vortex at play. The assassination of Soleimani was argued as crucial in undermining Iran's ambitions to dominate the region. Accordingly, the action would advance US efforts to undermine Iran in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. But did it? Certainly, Iran lost a valuable and effective commander, but a new head of the El Quds force was named almost immediately. I think it's important that we all understand that the El Quds Force is not a one-man operation. It's well organized and has many experienced and capable leaders. It would be foolish to think that the assassination of one man, even a tactical genius, will seriously erode the regional activities of El Quds. Further, as I have said, our actions gave opponents in Iraq, and certainly they're largely from the Iranian-influenced political figures and their paramilitary forces. But it gave our opponents there a strong argument for throwing the US out of Iraq. As I said, the violation of Iraqi sovereignty was an affront to Iraqis. And after years of security cooperation, at a time when ISIS is resurgent, we've completely kneecapped the Iraqis who would argue for a continued US presence. Iran could not have asked for a better outcome. Iran benefited in yet another way. 
Over the past several months, we've seen large popular demonstrations against the Iraqi government, seen as corrupt and inept. The Iraqi people are demanding significant political reform. More significantly, the demonstrators focused on Iranian influence, demanding that Iran stop its meddling and in interventions in Iraq. The US hit on Soleimani, then, however, became the dominant headline. Overshadow overshadowing the demonstrators calling for an end to Iranian influence. The US strike uh, then sent the focus on a more of a demand that all force, foreign forces leave Iraq. Now, personally, I think this is a short-term gain for Iran, because I, certainly public ire in Iraq toward Iran is, is far more deeply trenched uh, than I think their, their views about American military presence. Iran-backed militia were heralded by Iraqis initially as patriots who saved Iraq from ISIS radicals. But when elements of those forces entered the political system, they were seen as just another group siphoning off Iraq's wealth into their pockets. Renda Rahim, co-founder of the and president of the Iraqi Foundation and a former Iraqi ambassador to the United States, highlighted another important consequence of the assassination and the subsequent vote in the National Assembly. She notes immediately that the votes uh, were driven by Shia members. She noted that, in fact, most Sunni members and all Kurdish parliamentarians boycotted that meeting. And she said that such a vote driven by one faction has further undermined the state, isolating two key constituents. And I just might add then that this outcome undercuts one, one of the other objectives that America has had for some time, and that is promoting the unity and stability of Iraq. For two, two decades, that has been our goal. And one strike has now pitted main elements uh, of the ethnic and sectarian uh, country, uh, in the country, against each other. In summation, look, I have deliberately utilized the US assassination solely as a means to describe the widespread ramifications of any action and how those ramifications impact on other issues of vital US concern. So if Iraq is important, Iran is the juggernaut, juggernaut concern. In the 40 years plus, I should have said, since the establishment of the Islamic Republic of Iran, we have seen Iran's power and position in the region expand exponentially. Look at the facts. A key foreign policy objective of Iran has been to establish a Shia axis connecting Iran to the Mediterranean. Iran certainly with considerable Russian support, succeeded in its determination to see Ashar al-Assad's Alawite regime in Syria survive. It has provided crucial assistance to Hezbollah in Lebanon, enabling that organization to expand its influence in Lebanon itself and to develop a military capability that is a real threat to neighboring Israel. Cleverly, the opportunistic regime in Tehran has sided with the Houthi movement in Yemen, knowing that it would set off alarm bells in Riyadh. The Saudi fear of encirclement by Iran has led to huge Saudi financial outlays in efforts to defeat the Houthis. And it also led to widespread international condemnation of Saudi attacks on civilians. Further, Iran has continued to develop a significant military a missile capability, most recently seen in the use of ballistic missiles to attack bases in Iraq used by American forces. It has also threatened to obstruct the movement of oil from the Persian Gulf, attacked several tankers, and seized others on various pretexts. In the most dramatic action, Iran attacked key Saudi oil facilities with drones and missiles curtailing almost half of Saudi oil production. And then there's Iran's nuclear program. 
In response to the US, US withdrawal from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, so-called JCPOA, coupled with our policy of maximum pressure through crippling economic sanctions, Iran announced incremental steps to reconstitute its nuclear program. In other words, moving away from the commitments it made under the JCPOA, moving towards what many people in the region fear could be a nuclear bomb. U.S. actions to confront this exasperatingly ideologically based regime are open to credi credible skepticism as to whether they are succeeding or not. On the one hand, administration officials argue that economic sanctions will ultimately bring Iran back to the negotiating table. They deny that they want regime change, yet there are individuals who do mention regi regime change, arguing that sanctions are going to lead to domestic pressure that will topple the current leadership. Now, very few persons who know Iran believe that such an outcome is possible. They cite the regime's willingness to use maximum force against any opposition, as well as the entrenchment of the IRGC in both economic and security fields. But this ambiguity, whether the US policy is regime change or behavior change, raises an important question. If the US cannot even enunciate its own policy, how do we expect to get a coherent message to Tehran? The controversy over the JCPOA, often labeled the Iran deal, is a stark example of the vortex in which we operate. Our Arab allies in the Gulf and Israel were largely opposed to that agreement. Arab governments feared that this agreement was a first step toward US rapprochement with Iran, a rapprochement that would be at their expense. And they also argued that the US was failing to understand that Iran's ultimate goal was to dominate the region, and the nuclear agreement did nothing to address that threat. The US withdrawal from the JCPOA, however, didn't really end the debate. Regional states remain concerned about Iran's nuclear program, and that concern has grown as Iran announced the series of steps that I mentioned toward resurrecting their nuclear program. Uncertainty as to what the US policy toward Iran is post-JCPOA only compounds their fears. America's response to recent Iranian actions only magnified the uncertainty and spawned a major crisis of confidence in our Arab and Israeli allies. Let's begin with the most dramatic action, the attack on Saudi oil facilities. <clears throat> An informal understanding between the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia goes back to a meeting between uh, President Roosevelt and King Abdulaziz Saud in 1945. And incidentally, this past Sunday was the 75th anniversary of that encounter. And under the understanding that came from that meeting, it was that Saudi Arabia would supply oil and the US would provide security. Now, admittedly, much has happened. Uh, in the years uh, between then and now. Um, but the Saudis and the other Gulf states have always seen the US as central to their security. The calculation of our Arab allies, as well as us, by the way, was that America's close ties, backed by military power, would deter Iran from military actions. Iran's attack on the Saudi oil facilities challenged the validity of that calculation. The apparent failure of the United States to take any action against the Iranians after their attack on Saudi Arabia was a fundamental blow of confidence on the reliability of their American ally. And let's remember that this attack followed Iranian attack on shipping in the Gulf, which I mentioned earlier where we also did not respond. That action, in my opinion, was absolutely astonishing. It is a US commitment to act against any efforts to close the Strait of Hormuz or to inhibit the free flow of oil from the Persian Gulf has been a bedrock of American foreign policy for decades. As one Arab observer noted, and this is a quote, 
It is clear that the US will not act to protect us, being the Arabs, but only react if an American is killed. Of course, he's referring to the fact that when um, a pro-Iranian force in Iraq launched rockets against an American um, group in Iraq and killed an American, the US did retaliate in some contrast to the times that we did not. In fact, I would tell you that the US has not enunciated clearly US policy in the region today. In its absence, actions and inactions become the basis of speculation and interpretation. Such vagueness is dangerous as interpretations can seriously, wrongly lead one party or another to take actions that precipitate a response that was not expected. A further uh, complication is the difference between rhetoric and action. Presidential tweets vow that Iran will play dearly if it attempts to close the Straits of Hormuz. But as I said in response, when several tankers were mined and seized, there was no response. The president tweeted that we would hit even cultural sites in Iran. And within hours, the Secretary of State dismissed such a threat. And there are numerous other examples of contradictory statements that leave both friends and enemies uncertain as to what is, in fact, US policy. I think the most egregious of such um, contradictory statements was the announcement that we were pulling all of our troops out of Syria, followed almost immediately by an assertion that no, forces would stay to make sure that the Syrian oil fields did not fall into the hands of ISIS. Note, neither the uh, uh, announcement of withdrawal or the reversal said anything about the impact of those decisions on our Kurdish allies, a fact that was noted by our other allies in the region and further heightened their doubts of US reliability. The, for the vortex plays out, as I said, as a decision in one theater impacts on another. Well, the US is not the only one where there are inconsistencies. The messaging from Tehran is inconsistent as well and adds to the confusion and misunderstanding. Right after the missile attack on the two Iraqi bases that hosted American forces, one Iranian official threatened more retaliation. Another official noted that the attack deliberately did not aim to kill Americans. Further statements left any assessment of Iranian intentions to considerable speculation. And yet a consensus view among those who follow Iran is that there will be further Iranian actions against the American presence in the region. And further, that Iran will bide its time and it will act through surrogates that give Iran deniability. The comments of Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Zarif at the just concluded Munich Security Conference are classic. He said, Iran would not take further action, but that he could not say what the Iraqis might do, persons over which Iran really has no control. Really? Uh huh. Well, if there are inconsistencies in US and Iranian statements and actions, there are similar issues with our Arab allies. They traditionally wanted the US to take a hard line with Iran, and it was just reiterated today to Secretary Pompeo in Riyadh. They traditionally wanted the US to really be tough. Yet following the assassination of Soleimani and the subsequent Iranian retaliation, all the Arab Gulf states called for immediate restraint. And they did so in fear that Iran would target them in any escalation of hostilities. In fact, they are vulnerable to such attacks as we saw with the attack on Saudi oil facilities. And look, let's face it, the states in this region have seen a constant tension and wars over the last 40 years. The last thing they want is another conflagra conflagration. I understand that. So these states call for pressure on Iran, but not pressure that leads to military confrontation. They're the same allies, of course, that were so negative about the JCPOA, and are now so alarmed that Iran is again developing its nuclear program. 
So if they don't want a deal and they don't want war, what do they want? These are just questions that hang out there that all of us who work in and deal in the region are constantly trying to answer. So add to the Gulf vortex the division within the Gulf Cooperation Council itself. And this is self-inflicted. Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt severed relations with Qatar and imposed an economic blockade. Among other things, the four accused Qatar of supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, which they view as a terrorist organization. And secondly, accused Qatar of maintaining relations with Iran, which they, of course, were trying to contain. The consequences of this division are serious. The US has about 70,000 troops in the region. The US Army in Kuwait, the Navy in Bahrain, and Central Command Headquarters in Qatar. The GCC rift complicates the US's ability, the military ability, to coordinate security, and it inhibits military cooperation among the six states that we count on most to be our regional allies. As I mentioned, one of the major complaints against Qatar was its relationship with Iran. Yet Saudi and UAE efforts to isolate Qatar have in fact pushed Qatar toward a closer relationship with Iran. When the rift began, the president tweeted congratulations to the GCC for ostracizing Qatar. Then the US administration reversed itself and welcomed the Emir of Qatar here in Washington. US policy does, in fact, seem reactive and inconsistent, to say the least. But since then, to be honest, we have spent the better part of two years urging the parties to resolve the differences to little avail. Last year, there seemed to be movement toward reconciliation, but recent statements by both Saudi Arabia and Qatar say that that progress has stymied. Well, as I've tried to demonstrate the issues at play in the Gulf region are intertwined in very, very complex ways. A party with interest in the region certainly must take actions that it considers necessary to defend its interest. Taking that action will have ramifications on others in the region, and it will also impact on their views of their own interests. We've seen that in recent times, as countries in the region become increasingly uncertain about their relationship with America. They then conclude that they must search for alternatives, alternatives which I submit may not be what the US wants. Several examples come to mind rather immediately. It's the outreach of many countries in the region, including Israel, but also all of our Arab allies to Russia. The Saudi and UAE decision to intervene in Yemen's civil war. The apparent efforts of several Gulf states, in addition to Qatar, to reach out to Iran. If we believe the press reports, and that includes Saudi Arabia, but I'll have to add to my remarks at this point that I read a, an email just recently with a news report where the Saudis told the Secretary of State today in Riyadh that that was absurd. There were no back channels whatsoever. That, of course, doesn't mean that there aren't, but that's the public line. Now, now look, doing so is understandable from their perspective. But it does raise a question as to the depth of their support for US efforts to confront Iran's actions in the region. As the doubts about US reliability grow, we're going to see those states taking actions that they consider vital to support their own national interest. And that may often happen without them even communicating with us. So with US messaging so incoherent, how can we expect anything else? The quandary for the US is obvious. There are situations that require US actions, regardless of the impact that action may have on others in the region or on our other priorities. There are situations where our friends in the region have a different perspective on how we should respond. And those differences may be hard to reconcile. There are, however, ways to ameliorate the consequences of the Gulf vortex and the conundrums that we face. The US must state more clearly than we have our interest in the region and our objectives. 
contradictory statements and reversals must cease. And secondly, it is critical that the U.S. rebuild its relationships and credibility with our Arab allies in the Gulf. This requires closer dialogue and better appreciation on both sides for the concerns of the other. The U.S. must recall that the importance of coalitions in our past is true today. Coalitions with other countries that engage a larger international community response when there is a crisis. Building such coalitions necessitates a recognition by the U.S. that we must listen to and consider others' opinions and points of view. We must alter our tendency of the past few years to see ourselves always as right and be dismissive when others have different views. We may not get support for a specific action that we want to take, but with adjust adjustments that gain allied support, our actions are likely to be far more successful. The U.S. must understand that while its military power remains enormous, military action does not, in and of itself, solve or even alleviate situations and issues that we face in the Gulf region today. To increase our ability to achieve our interest in the Gulf, it's vitally important that the U.S. strengthens its diplomatic capacities and thus expand the possible courses of action available to address those regional issues. Dialogue with our partners is central to building support, and it has been woefully inadequate in recent years. At this moment, the ship of state is adrift. It's tossing and turning reactively to events. There seems to be no coherent plan to deal with the winds and the waves that buffet us in the region. The captain's actions are erratic. His professional crew is ignored. The ship is taking on water, but it need not sink. Avoidance of more dire consequences are going to require a fundamental change in how we drive the ship forward. And I'll leave you with this looming and unanswerable question. Will the US administration take the necessary actions to save the ship? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Ganim, for that insightful lecture. We'll now have about 30 minutes for questions, and um, Ambassador will field his own questions. The honor of the first question. You didn't say, maybe because you don't have all the time that's necessary, that you need a full course. I make people pay tuition for a course to yeah. be able to handle all of those kinds of things. Maybe I'll audit, <laughs> with your permission. <laughs> But actually, I'm glad you gave you your, uh, your, your, your lecture here and gave it the uh, direction that you assigned to it. I wanted to ask you whether this was a comment or a rebuttal or an answer to the op-ed that uh, Martin Indyk published recently where he talked about the United States leaving the region. Thank you. Uh, in fact, it is, was not because I didn't read that op-ed. <laughs> But I shall now that you've called it to my attention. Um, there has been a debate about that, as uh, you from the region and others will know. Uh, this was one of the very disconcerting um, developments uh, in the region when Obama, President Obama, so we're not just talking about the current administration, talked about needing to reemphasize our situation in Asia. And that was interpreted by most of our friends in the Gulf as a decision to withdraw a presence. And in spite of the fact that uh, both political figures, but particularly our military commanders, pointed out constantly how large our presence was, that uh, it didn't convince uh, everyone. Every time I travel to the region, I get asked that question, are you leaving? Are you leaving? Are you leaving? And um, 
I have tried every uh, skill that I thought I had re accomplished during my diplomatic life, and the rubber band seems to go right back where it was after I finish. So, indeed. The ambassador is quite right. There's so much more to say about Iraq than I did today, and for that I apologize. Uh, that if, if I had gone through it, I'd have to give you breakfast as well as dinner <laughs> or whatever. So. Uh, another question? Back up here in the back. Uh, hi, Ambassador Ganim. Uh, Michelle Dunn from the Carnegie Endowment. Um, the International Monetary Fund put out a report a couple of weeks ago about the Gulf Cooperation uh, Council countries, and it was really talking about um, changing global energy markets and the profound effect it would have uh, that, you know, global oil, demand for oil would, would peak and then decline in the next couple of decades and that urgent changes are needed both to build uh, alternative economies in the Gulf to begin to, uh, to pull back spending by Gulf governments as well as to raise revenue through taxation, et cetera. How do you see this constellation of issues as affecting U.S. interests and what the nature of U.S. engagement in the Gulf region should be? Very, very good question, Michelle. Um, the, the report is, is really ex extremely good. It was very comprehensive, and it raised all of the kinds of, of, of issues that are at play that you, you mentioned then. Because there is a big question about the future of oil and energy and where that's going. And there's also the issue of, um, of finite uh, amounts of resources, of, of oil resources. And, um, and, and these countries have not diversified, even though that is a major component of the rhetoric. And that's certainly part of the 2030 plan in Saudi Arabia. But their efforts to do it have usually stymied uh, as a result of internal politics in some countries, which I won't mention. Uh, but um, they have not succeeded in doing this. And you, but you draw it right back to then, what about that? What does that mean for US interest? And what does it mean for, for the future? Um, I would be, um, you would disbelieve me if I said that, the, the, that we aren't there for oil, because we are. Uh, and that's because oil has been historically so important for the global economy. And when you have half of the world's oil reserves in countries that touch the Persian Gulf, and there's a little uh, strait to which uh, such a large part of that oil passes through, then who controls it and whether or not it flows has been the critical importance. Well, what happens when that importance is, is less and less? Uh, when I've talked to people who are in the petroleum sector, uh, they basically believe that we are over-dramatizing the, the, the drop in the importance of oil uh, anytime soon, or at, at least that way. And they also point out that, uh, that people have been talking about oil reserves running out for decades. And in fact, for a couple of different reasons, uh, the reserves have actually made either been the same or gone up. Uh, that is, either because they found new fields, or probably more importantly, at least I think it is, is the technology that is new and different. Uh, I know that in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, they are drilling at depths that they didn't dream they ever could before. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the fracking and the technology that's gotten better and better there. Uh, what that does do, sorry, this is, goes on and on as an answer to your question, is that there are now other sources of, of oil or uh, oil substitutes than in the Gulf. And so that has certainly um, made the United States, actually in various moments in time recently, the largest oil producer in the world. Uh, but that, and in my class, if the students are in here, heard it, we had a whole class on the, whether about this. It, energy independence, meaning oil independence, and it's false. It's just a false. You have a global economy and a global market. Uh, even though we are maybe the biggest producer, we're also one of the world's largest importers, simply because we're one of the largest consumers. And if you look at the global market, the price of, of oil on the market is based on supply and demand. If something happens to the supply, let's say the straits are closed for some reason, or like what happened in Saudi Arabia, where half its production came off the, the market, 
then that's going to have a global impact on prices, even the price of the wellhead in the United States. So it, there isn't anything called uh, independence. Uh, it's interdependence in the world. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Judy. Right behind you. Oh, thank you. Brilliant as usual, of course. But I do have a basic question. How important do you think the region really is to our current ad administration? I don't get a feeling that he understands or quite you know, comprehends what goes on or how important it, our role could be or absence might be. Um, is it enough just to send his son-in-law there now and then to represent him? I mean, what should, what should we really be doing? Maybe move him there. Uh, <laughs> no, the, um, I, 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 I'm going to divulge my biases if I haven't already in my remarks. And, and, that, and that is clearly the people who are making decisions about things like I talked about today have no clue as to the backgrounds, the history. The, the, and, and this is not the first time in American history that's happened. But it's kind of overwhelming at the moment. Uh, and, um, and so when I said that the, um, the crew was well-seasoned and experienced, but it wasn't being listened to, uh, I hope you got the allegorical references <laughs> that I was, was making there, because they're not. There are people who do know, uh, but the, the current administration and the centers on the president it doesn't trust uh, the people who have the knowledge, and they see them only as, a, uh, as obstacles. And so he's gotten rid of a lot of people who ought to be in government and providing that kind of advice. Yes. Thank you. Um, and some questions. Alana is oh, our vice dean. Sorry, Alana Feldman, vice dean. Another one of my bosses. <laughs> um, my question actually follows a little bit on the last one. So you gave a very compelling statement and account of what should happen, what is necessary in order to right the ship, in order for the, the U.S. to be a more productively engaged you know, partner in the, with the region. Given that there's not a lot to lead, lead us to think that that's going to happen, um, at least in the short run, and I know that you have been a counselor to U.S. governments, but if that can't be the audience for this message, what other parties might be able to take up a productive role? Or what other, either state parties or non-state parties, um, in trying to you know, be involved in shaping events? Well, traditionally, there have been a number of those groups. Uh, they are a combination of think tanks with lots of influential people who've been in government before, who produce excellent analysis and pr provide some thoughts about going forward. Uh, there have always been people in our Congress with knowledge about the, the world and the situation. But what this is discouraging is the way the current administration has managed to intimidate uh, everyone. And it's not just Amer in the American uh, system. But um, as you were asking your question, I was just reminded of how our Arab Gulf allies are dealing with the current administration. They will tell you often in private how, all, how uncertain they are and the considerations of reliability. And if they're really uh, enjoying the evening, they will tell you that um, we're afraid that we wake up in the morning that you both won't be here at all. But they mean Trump, and they'll use Trump's name. And that's because of the inconsistency and so, but yet they don't want to say and do things that will bring retribution on them. I was just reading an article again today uh, uh, written uh, by someone here in Washington on Jordan and the king and, and, the, and the problems that the king has today with this new peace plan and the dilemma it places Jordan, which is, has the largest number of Palestinian refugees in the world, and yet well, you know what's happening. And so he has actually come out vocally opposed to the plan and made some other remarks. 
and the article was writing, is Jordan going to suffer when the president decides he's no longer a friend and withdraws the substantial ec economic assistance program to Jordan, which is the only thing that's keeping, I'm being simplistic here, but the major way that the economy is even surviving today. And, and all of the Gulf states, all of the leaders out there, fear that if they say some of the things they would like to say, that their retribution will be harmful either to them personally or to their country. And so they don't, which is not the answer to your question, but it's, it, make, it makes it more difficult to see how we're going to get out of the present situation. Rich Kozlerich from George Mason University. Uh, among other countries you didn't mention were, uh, is Turkey. And I wonder if you could comment a bit on, on Turkey's role in what seems to be an emerging neo-Ottoman uh, impetus uh, that is coming against neo-Persian ambitions. It's almost the 19th century all over again. Yeah. <laughs> Rich uh, is a good friend. And, and Rich has just brought up a good example of, 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 of how the people who are currently running our government don't have any sense of history and, and what's been going on. And so trying to deal with it, they missed some very, very key points. And, and Rich made some good ones. Yes, Turkey under Erdogan has, this goes back now to the uh, Arab Spring, really, uh, been very assertive in a relationship with those parts of the Middle East that he saw some synchronization with. The Muslim Brotherhood uh, was, uh, was the group. And then he, when that fell apart, of course, then the relationship with Egypt deteriorated. We also see there a deep engagement into Syria. Uh, and then the Kurdish question, oh, boy, this has got a lot of, lot of facets. Uh, and, um, and in fact, it, it just recently, it looked to me like, even they didn't call it, there was a battle of military engagement between Turkish and Syrian forces uh, within the last uh, two days, uh, which is kind of serious. But um, the, the uh, Turks, uh, Erdogan, have reached out to any of the groups in the, to the south of them that were having troubles with the people that they had no good relationships with as kind of a counterfoil. I, I, I'm sorry, that's an abstract. Let me give you an example. Qatar, remember the division, isolated. Uh, Turkey immediately said that we're your good friends, and uh, by the way, they may reach an agreement, and Turkish troops were, were assigned to, uh, to Qatar. I don't know about whether the Turks really like the climate there, but, they, uh, but they, they're there. And, uh, and why? Because they don't like the way the Saudis and others are doing it, and so they're elbowing their way in for influence. So it is, a, it is a, in a certain way, the Ottoman kind of mentality that they have some kind of role in the region. But I would also say on the counterpoint, not many Arabs uh, buy into this. Uh, I remember a conversation I had in Jordan, and this has been some years ago, admittedly, uh, when um, the, uh, the subject of, of Turkey came up, and they were being a bit assertive at that time. And my Jordanian friends immediately said, the last thing we need are the Ottomans back here. Uh, and they remember when there was an Ottoman Empire, and it wasn't a very pleasant experience. And so I think the history works against them uh, a lot, but they play at it. And that's what I think that they're doing. And I'm not sure they're going to be very successful, uh, particularly uh, in their southern border. They do face a huge problem. I think the figure is almost a million people, uh, uh, 700 to 900,000 figures I've seen here in the last few days of, of uh, Syrians in, in flight from the Syrian advance toward the Turkish border, where they already, they, the Turks, already have a huge a refugee issue. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, this is not a good situation. It continues to, 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 to deteriorate. Uh, Ted. Uh, yes, Ambassador Ted Katouf. Uh, I've been puzzled for some time. I know you get out to the Gulf. But when Obama was in office the latter years and the JCPOA was uh, negotiated and signed and the like, 
uh, a number of our Gulf allies were livid and had to be strong-armed to go along and acquiesce in it, uh, believing that they were being sold out. And they wanted a more robust policy towards Iran. And then you get the Trump administration, and they rip up the JCPOA, and they launch an economic war on Iran. And Iran says, well, you know, we're not going to just allow you to pursue an economic war against us. It's going to be your Gulf allies are going to suffer. And they've demonstrated how they can make that happen and how they can even make us suffer. And I, I don't mean this condescendingly, but it seems to me there's almost been a sense of magical thinking among the Gulf leaders that somehow we could get tough with Iran, uh, but it wouldn't lead to war, it wouldn't lead to their installations, their power plants, their desalination plants and the like being hit, uh, and or their economies being shut down like in Dubai. So if you can explain what you think their mentality has been over the last couple of years, I'd appreciate it. Well, Ted, you, um, in maybe a little bit stronger language than I use, actually uh, repeated some of the things that I had said in my remarks. Um, and I did leave a question. If they don't want this and they don't want that, what do they really want? I don't have an answer to that question. I'm not sure that they do for exactly the same reasons. But let's face it, whether you like it or not, and of course I don't think any of us do, the message that the Iranians gave the Saudis by attacking the oil facilities was just how vulnerable you are, right? And so that, that certainly provides some impetus to those leaders to kind of find back channels and to try to think of other ways of dealing it, deal with the relationship or the issue. But if you remember, it was Obama that made it, I'm gonna have to paraphrase and it's not gonna be quite right, actually said at one point to the, was it to the Saudis, that you need to get used to the fact that they live in the region and figure out a way to live with them. They went berserk with that. They just live it. But it's actually true. Um, and the other point that I would make, and this has been a long time concern of mine, is that you know, we have got to have some way of improving our relationship with Iran. I realize there are obstacles there, but there are also obstacles here. We too have to realize that they're in the region. And somehow they need to be brought into a system where they're not hegemonic, but they're also recognized. In fact, one of the things that, um, that I harp on in my course, if I use that word, is that the Iranians always have felt like they've not been respected and not been uh, treated as important as they are. Now, they have a self-importance that far exceeds what they really are. I admit that immediately, uh, because they'll tell you about Darius and Cyrus and the empire that went all the way to Athens. Uh, you know, well, OK. But um, the truth of the matter is, is that they can point in recent decades. They would tell you about how the British treated them when they had all the oil concessions and gave them pittance in return. They'll tell you about uh, both czarist and then uh, Soviet intrusions of influence in the North and uh, setting up puppet governments. They'll, they'll point out to the fact that the country that they thought was the most friendly and the most likely to be an ally forever supported a coup against Mossadegh. That was the United States and Britain. And so, you know, they have, and then you get to the Iraq-Iran war. There are lots of things I could say about that where they have justification uh, when Iraq used uh, gas in huge quantities, and we're signatories to a, an international treaty on the use, we didn't say a thing. In fact, informally, we blocked Security Council even discussing it. Now, we had a lot of support. But so, I mean, there, there's a grievance there that's real. Uh, but I'm not sure it's going to be easy. I thought, this is me, I thought that the JCPOA was at least an opening. Whether or not it would lead to anything, we won't know in retrospect. But it was an opportunity. I think we could have used that opportunity incrementally. It wasn't going to be an embassy or an American diplomatic presence in Tehran overnight, no. But there were other things. Look, we were fighting, it's strange to say, but we were on the same side against ISIS, right? 
anyway, so there are, there are some elements, and, and I think that the withdrawal, because even the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency has stated on a repetitive basis that Iran was adhering to the agreement. They poured concrete in one of their whatever it was. Um, you can't really get that out very easily. But the point being is that they did make some changes. And when we walked out, then our own credibility in entering into another agreement at some other point in time is going to require a lot more on our side to make them believe it. So that's sad, but that's where we are today. Another question? And then I'll get to one in the back. First, first you. Yeah. No, you. Hi, John Hansen. Um, you talk about the crew being ignored. Uh, the crew really knows how to run the ship. And the last lecture, the one before, you talked about the fact that you were worried that if things don't change, the old hands who are career people at the department uh, may leave. I stand before you as an alum of the Justice Department who signed uh, that letter. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I hope you're with me when I get audited. But uh, uh, my question is, how do the, the, those in the, in the region uh, view um, uh, the fact that we may, if, if, if this continues for another four years, that we may lose uh, members of that crew who, if they're not ignored, could really bring wisdom to our decisions over there. Are they the folks in the region who would do us harm or who are looking out for their own interests? Are they worried, as you said you were, about the loss of those, of those crew members at the State Department? Uh, yes, I, I, I remain very, very much concerned about the way things have gone uh, personnel-wise at the State Department. That's a fact. Um, it's, um, it's been interesting uh, as I try to follow it from the outside. Uh, what I am told is that the budget for the department, even though the president continues to send up budgets with huge cuts, that the Congress puts it back in or doesn't support the cuts. I think it was the current one was 22%. Remember? I think it was 22% cut. That won't last. But... Uh, there was enough money in the budget this past year for the State Department to hire at the levels that they had been traditionally doing. That's a, a change from two, three years ago. Uh, so what, what bothers me, there are two things to say. On a positive side, the individuals who are going into the Foreign Service, I'm talking about young people, but now some are uh, older as well, are top-notch. They are extraordinarily good and they are going to be the strength of tomorrow if they stay. The negative is that large numbers of senior officials, foreign service officers, careerists, have been forced out or have decided enough is enough and have left. And what bothers me, OK, on the substance side, what bothers me is that that expertise is not there when it's needed. But if the people there that you would talk to won't listen, then they're not going to be effective. But more importantly to me, and this is a careerist speaking, is that those people who've been in the Foreign Service, and I, there's some here in the audience tonight that I respect greatly, they were mentors for the others who were coming up. I can tell you from a personal experience that the people that I worked under when I was a young officer, even a middle grade officer, taught me how to be what I became. Not the bad part, but the good part, right? Uh, but, but, and, and I remember being taken to a meeting and told, you're, you're going to be the backup note taker, and having them tell me when we got back to the office, did you see what happened when such and such occurred? You know, see how this so-and-so responded to that? And then he didn't let away with it? That's a good way to do it. In other words, I learned from having someone tell me about things like that when the people are not there to do that, or if the, if the numbers of people get cut dramatically, then there are not enough people there to do the mentoring because they're swamped, or they're not there with the experience to be able to give that advice. This is long-term implications. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, 
goes beyond uh, whether it's a four-year or, or an eight-year term. It's really, really sad. And it's still a problem. I, I, I'll give you this, um, uh, again, a, a, anecdote. I happened quite by chance. Um, uh, Steve McKinley um, was an officer that was appeared in the newspaper a, a, a few months ago, having resigned from the Foreign Service. I just happened to run into him here in front of the old Red Cross building. He, he came into the Foreign Service when I was uh, head of the junior office division. He was one of the new people that came in. And he said, well, Skip. I said, how are you doing? He said, I just resigned. I said, what do you mean you just resigned, Steve? Whatever. He said, secretary, this is Pompeo, um, called me down in Brazil where I was ambassador, asked me to come back to be his key, uh, I'm not sure what the title is, but in, in his office, head of the, uh, you know, in the office, the assistant, right? And I did. And I tell you, I was really taken by things that were going to be different, whatever. But when he wouldn't say one thing nice in defense of our ambassador who was kicked out of Ukraine, I walked in and I told him, I can't work for you anymore. I have lost my respect for you. And I resigned. Now, um, now you get me on a soapbox, so I'll keep going. And that is that I understand, look, look, every ambassador, myself included, and some of those who are in the room have been ambassadors, we serve at the pleasure of the president. That is a fact. He doesn't have to tell us why he doesn't want us. All he has to do is to say, thank you, bye-bye, and we're gone. That happened to me at least in one of my tours. I ended up okay in another job, but still. So that's okay. So the secretary could have done what he did, which is you pull the person out because that's what the president said. But you could have made a remark along the lines I just said. Every ambassador serves at the will of the president. But she has had a distinguished career in the Foreign Service. And I have a lot of respect for someone like her who's done all kinds of assignments. And cha -cha -cha -cha. He could have said that. Or maybe something a little bit shorter than I just said. But it would have said to people in the Foreign Service, I, I respect you as a service, I respect you as people, and, and he didn't. And I think that changed attitudes toward him in a fairly dramatic way. Uh, there was a question back here. Uh, uh, okay, yes ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you for such an insightful lecture and uh, overview of the issues in the Middle East. I'm from Saudi Arabia, a student here. Uh, I have two questions, quickly. Um, the first question is, how do you think, in your opinion, the US should have responded to the oil attacks um, in Saudi Arabia? Im immediate responses, uh, maybe. Um, and the second question is, given that Qatar is in a region that is really fixed on having allies and enemies um, defined very um, narrowly, you can say, and Qatar chooses not to fit in that um, in terms of their foreign policy. How do you, or in your perspective, how sustainable is that? You mean the division? Uh, uh, there was the last part I wasn't quite sure what you were asking. Um, so for Qatar, they have ha chosen or tried to maintain um, relationships with both friends and enemies. Um, and I'm just asking, how sustainable is it in a region okay. like the Middle East? I, yep, good, good, good. Um, both good questions. Um, I have to tell you that um, I became very worried about the potential of Iranian action when we didn't respond with the tanker problem to the south, when that happened well before the attack on the oil facilities. I remember being in a board meeting. I'm on the board of the American Gulf States Institute. We have actually two Saudi, uh, prominent Saudis on that board. And I was asking them at that time, um, what, what do you think is going to happen? And what they said was, if there isn't any reaction, and I mean some action, uh, by the United States and by us now, there will be something else later that's going to be much worse. And they actually predicted, not the actual incident, but they did predict what happened. So my, my first part of my answer to you is, we should have been more robust in responding. What do you do? You know what? We did it in the, during the uh, Iraq-Iran war when we were trying to escort ships. When an Iranian vessel comes out and does something like that, 
You go after it, you sink it. Eh, it's okay. That doesn't open a war. But you send a message to the Iranians, and I do believe the Iranians listen to, to robust um, actions, uh, that they do take that into account. Um, but as far as how to react once the Saudi, uh, and the Saudi oil facilities, uh, that's a, a little harder one to think of because I wouldn't see a tit for tat. I wouldn't see going and bombing the Abadan refinery as, as the thing to do. But um, there, there are some things that are of less uh, nature. Should have sent a signal to the Iranians that what they do is going to cost them, uh, is my view. And again, this goes back to, um, and there are people in the room here, by the way, who know a lot more about Iran than I do, uh, but I actually talk like I know a lot. Um, uh, so you're supposed to think I do, anyway. But I remember very much that when we went into Iraq with our troops, large numbers, the Iranians were quite afraid that they were going to be next, that that large a U.S. force on their border was coming their way next. And they were very careful. In fact, they even sent signals to us that certain things, if, it crossed, if certain people we wanted cross the border, they would return them to us and things like that. Until the Arabic word is fauda, you know what that is, chaos of, of what happened in Baghdad. And we, if they saw we lost control of the situation, they became far more emboldened and started doing things. That's just, again, one example of where I think that when they, they have respect for power, and therefore, they've got to be sensitized to, to that power. Now, the second question about, about uh, gutter and maintaining relations, look, almost every country in the world ends up in that dilemma, ends up in that situation. Uh, but if you think of Oman, Oman has managed to maintain relations with Iran over uh, a, a long period of time, as well as maintaining its, its role within the GCC and has not done it to a degree where it's created a split. The Kuwaitis who are in the north, who are geographically much <laughs> closer to uh, Iraq and Iran, uh, as I maintained a relationship. Um, they, and, and so it can be done. You know, I've, I've been so involved in the Persian Gulf for so many years, uh, and with the Qataris directly, and I could be, a, this may offend a, someone from Qatar, but you know, they brought some of this on their own head. Uh, and when I say that, it's that they've always tried to prove that they were just big, much bigger than their size and everything else. And um, they enjoyed, over the years, doing things that, the best I can give you as an example, sticking the finger in the Saudi eye. <laughs> like that, you know. Uh, not too badly, but just <laughs> get to them, you know, kind of a thing. And I can give you some examples of when they did it. So they invite, uh, you know, kind of a reaction from others, and not just the Saudis, but others. And, um, you know, they, they, ma they managed, to some extent, to cause the, the trouble for themselves. But I do believe that the Saudis and Emiratis actually went too far. Uh, that the importance of, of unity or at least a semblance. No, it's more than a semblance. To maintain, there's so many reasons why the six Gulf states work together on things that that ought to be, have been maintained rather than going the direction that they did. There was a question from a gentleman just back next to you. Hi, Ambassador. Thank you. Um, my question is more regarding, uh, you had mentioned that the GCC nations, uh, specifically back uh, when we had uh, made the agreement with Saudi uh, regarding like oil for protection kind of deal, um, how does a lot of those nations are coming, are becoming kind of wary uh, of, I guess, the U.S. capability to, to defend them uh, with the current, I guess, fifth fleet? How could the U.S. respond to their allies kind of being wary of, I guess, responses and things like that in the, I guess, area? Yeah, well, a couple of thoughts come to mind. The first one is that one of the things that you hear from uh, the people who live in the region, and I'm, I'm speaking of both leaders of people outside of government, businessmen and others, is that they don't think that the United States really understands the region. 
doesn't really understand what's going on out there, uh, and therefore doesn't make wise decisions. That bothers them. But taking it just a bit further, the deployment of forces to Saudi Arabia that we have done is a deliberate attempt to reassure the Saudis about our commitment to their security. That was hyped and reiterated. I shouldn't have probably used the word hyped. It was emphasized by Pompeo here in the last 24 hours in Riyadh. It also is a signal to the Iran that we are now there in a different way. But the question that gets back to some of the things I said, if you have to be very careful about your rhetoric and your actions because you've got to convince them that when you say something, you mean it. And if you say something and you don't mean it, you're going to learn that pretty fast. And then they'll do something that, again, as I said earlier, that was unexpected and then puts us in the dilemma of the question that I just had, which is, what do you then do? Um, and again, uh, the Iranians are, are very clever. Um, they, they have this long view of history that we do not have. It doesn't matter to them whether they do something today or tomorrow or even next month or next year. They're going to be around. And they also said, we'll use surrogates. They, they, there will be things that will happen that won't be easily attributable to them. Though it's getting a little harder. It's getting a little harder. Um, so. OK, we have time for just one more question. Yes, back here. Oh, Rusty, did you have a question? No, no, yes. <laughs> Thank you. We can make it. Ambassador Ganim. <laughs> Gordon Adams. Good evening, Good to Gordon. See you. Good to see you. Um, I, I was struck at the end. I had a number of questions in my mind, but I was struck at the end by the um, image behind you, that you chose to speak of the ship of state as a large piece of US military equipment. And so the question that I have for you, which really is going at least back to the Lebanon invasion, 19, Marine Corps in Lebanon 1980s, is whether over time we haven't diminished that currency, that the uses and applications of military force in the region are not only not effective, but to some degree counterproductive. So the question that I have for you is, what, what, is, what does the real ship of state look like? That is to say, what should be the balance of the tools of American statecraft if my premise is right, which is our particularly thinking of Afghanistan and Iraq, our application of military force has either been a failure or counterproductive in terms of our diplomatic relationships in the region. Well, Gordon, you know me well enough to know that I uh, feel, I, I, I would say what you said, uh, which is that uh, military power has not been effective. Uh, and um, it has been counterproductive, actually, in our resort. And I actually think uh, this was part of the theme of my lecture last year, which is that we have so gone to the extent that anytime there's a problem, send in the military. They can solve it. And the idea is that they're mobilized, they're organized, they can do it. But they're not really trained to do and deal with the kinds of issues that are there, the sectarian conflicts. The, and these have to be dealt with more in the diplomatic and, and, uh, and, and the, uh, political way, uh, even economic way, and not in the military one. Uh, I'm so very sorry that you noticed <laughs> what you, you did. Uh, I, I have no explanation except that I know which slide I rejected, which would have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was just simply looking for a ship that I could go back to my allegory of the beginning and uh, somehow putting uh, uh, the Mayflower, it just wasn't, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't the right thing to do. <laughs> so, so, and Rushdie, I, you had a question, and I'm gonna, I'll do one more with you. No, it doesn't matter. Okay, doesn't. so very quickly, I, I take your point about the contradictions when it comes to um, US policy in, in the region, but there's one area in which the, the Trump administration has been quite consistent is um, the use of sanctions when it comes to Iran and really in, in try to cripple the Iranian economy and hopefully force Iran into some sort of, of negotiations. Right. At the same time, it seems that the Iranians have made the calculation that the Trump administration is a one-term administration 
And so until the election takes place in no, you know, November 2020, they will not have any incentive to engage with the US in any meaningful way. So comes November, let's say Trump is reelected. Do you see any scenario in which you know, Iran is somehow, somehow readjusts its calculation and comes to the table without losing face? Well, um, the losing face is a really important point. The, the implication of the president's remarks and others that the sanctions are going to somehow drive them. Uh, there was, you know, the unsinkable Molly Brown had that great scene at the beginning with the, the bully guys or wrestling with her saying, cry uncle, cry uncle, she said, and she refused and she refused. The Iranians are never going to cry uncle. They're just, it isn't in their constitution to do that. They'll go sink before they do that. So I don't think that's a good logic. Um, the other thing that, that comes to mind rather immediately, of course, is there are elections in Iran here in days. And the way, pardon? Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, that's right. And the way that it's been structured with the, all of the people who were denied ability to run, it's clear that the hardliners are going to just be in total control. So one could argue then that that doesn't mean anything is going to happen in terms of, of but on the other hand, we have Nixon as a, as a history lesson, um, that he would never, ever do anything with the communists, but he then goes to China. So, I mean, we, 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 can, we don't know that the way the situation develops, that even hardliners, uh, if they thought there was some situation, that they might be uh, amenable to it. But, you know, the, the supreme leader has made such an issue of the United States as a Satan, as the, as a as a basis, the, the, the foundation on which the regime stands. And you couple that with the IRGC and the way they are so dominant, even in the economy and in the politics, it's a little bit hard to see how there is going to be any sort of bend there. Thank you all very much.